faculty of the learning of the learning informatics lab at the college in the College of Education and Human Development and a faculty affiliate of the Data Science Initiative. Her research uses machine learning on family systems and adolescent development using large scale data sets. It's my pleasure to present you this MPC seminar series mug, which you can only get uh, by presenting here. Uh, and I look forward to hearing your research today. All right, take care. Thank you very much, Teresa. And thank you guys for inviting me. Thanks, Claire, for feeling my me at first. I, yeah, I, I love collecting mugs. So this is the perfect <laughs> reward for me. Um, so yeah, um, today I'm just going to talk about sort of using machine learning for human development and family research because um, I, so just a little bit more of my background, I got my PhD degree in human development family studies from uh, Penn State, which you know, is also where <laughs> I was trained. <laughs> uh, and also I got, a, and when I was at Penn State, I was in this uh, NSF traineeship program called Big Data Social Science. And so I also kind of got my minor in something called social data analytics, but it's really just about combining data science and social science. And so I feel like this is the kind of like project and a topic that I've been really interested in and really like dear to my heart. So I feel really excited to present this to you uh, today. So kind of just a little bit of old time, so I know a little bit about the background in our audience. Um, so. Why using yeah, so, so I guess it's we have we have a limited a number of people today, so we, we don't need to. So many people on Zoom, if you can um type the number. So one is I have never learned about machine learning. Two is I have learned about machine learning, but have not applied it in my own research. And three is I have applied machine learning in my own research. So you can type in your chat and then here I want to ask uh who had yeah, who's like one? So I've never learned about machine learning. Okay. Okay, two. I've learned great. Right. Yeah, I have learned about machine learning, but I've not applied it in my own research. I was at the stage two when I was taking um when I was in grad school and I was taking this class in statistics on like machine learning and data mining. And all what we did in that class was like the instructor or the professor was like writing all the mathematical proofs on blackboards <laughs> to explain machine learning models. And I was just like, I don't have to apply it to my research until later. So I'm like kind of now at three. So anyone at three with me? Yeah, you are? Yeah. What kind of, uh, what kind of, are you like doing supervised and supervised? Or? Yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Yeah, so mostly like in a supervised machine learning model, and I did use like a feature selection, like random forest model, lots of regression. That would be the primary one I use. And also some generalized boosted model that is also I'm using for my own research. Yeah. That's that's wonderful. I feel like, yeah, you you basically threw out all the terms I'm going to go through today, okay? <laughs> Surprise machine learning, lasso, random forest, feature selection, XG boost, uh, which I, I will also talk a little bit as well. So what I see on the chat, um, I see another three. So Kat, 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 Katerina, if you would want to type in the chat about what kind of uh, research you do using machine learning as well. And we have some twos and some ones. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I think we can proceed later. All, all related, but yeah, thank, thank you guys. I think uh, we have a good mix of you know each of these three categories, which I I think is great. And also, just want to sort of like a disclaimer, right? Like I I'm I've taken machine learning class. I've been using machine learning in my research since 2018, 2019. So I would say I'm a little bit kind of experienced machine learning researcher, but in the meantime, I wouldn't consider myself as like computer scientists or, you know, like a machine learning expert. So of course, if there's anything I say today that's um, inaccurate or even outdated, which is very likely because AI and machine learning is fastly developing as you all know, um, feel free to sort of correct me or like, you know, raise your hand and, and ask or, or contribute your own thoughts. So like what I said, you know, like right now, um, 
AI and machine learning is fascinating and walking. I'm sure everyone on this campus is talking about Chat GPT, which is also like an AI tool that um, we are all uh, excited and also unsure about. Um, but today I'm kind of mainly going to talk about almost like uh, like a baby step of machine learning, which is really far away from those like <laughs> fancy AI tools. But hopefully the hope today is to, to get to kind of understand a little bit some basic mechanisms of machine learning, how to potentially apply it to your own research. And so in the basically in the past decades, I feel like the utility of machine learning has really been gaining a lot of att attention in social sciences. So I've seen oh Okay. Got it. What about now? All right, better? Okay, sorry. I thought I was loud. <laughs> um, so I've seen um, a lot of like annual reviews even in, for example, in like sociology, political science, um, psychology, developmental psychology, people have been talking about uh, the utility of machine learning in a variety of ways in their research. So for example, as a developmental scientist, I've Notice, like it has been used in developmental science in a variety of ways. So, for example, first of all, you can use machine learning to process raw big data, like video and image data. I cited Gilmore here, but I actually myself also am using, like, for example, computer, computer vision models to process my image data in my research. And people have been using it to predict future developmental or health outcomes. They have, um, like, oh, what's your name? What's your name? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, like, like what Dell has said, you know, there are also people have been using like feature selection, trying to identify important features from a large set of features to, um, especially from large scale data sets for optimal study design model building. And of course, they, there are also some ways, for example, to combine like machine learning methods and some traditional or some method that we're more familiar with, like growth curve to create something to like discover developmental patterns. So more literature review, right? So beyond the development research, we've also been seeing it a lot in, or emerging at least in family research as well. So one like, I think famous one is like the one, the Fragile Families Challenge that was led by Matt Selgenick, um, published on PNAS in 2020. And they basically called for kind of like a competition based on the fam Fragile Families data set to ask people to build machine learning or to build predictive models um, to predict like six important life outcomes using their data. And I think like maybe 160 teams, that's what I remember, participated in this challenge. And a lot of them, of course, build like machine learning models to fulfill that, um, that challenge. And um, one of my favorite papers, um, this one takeaway, you're like, I, I don't know what paper to read to begin with. I would suggest the second paper, which is, again, my favorite paper from Samantha Joe, um, like uncovering the most robust self-report predictors of relationship quality. And this is a really good one to read. And uh, I myself let this paper um, that was published in 2020 on like of adolescence family experiences in predicting young adult edu uh, educational attainment. And then there was also this recent paper that I really like for leveraging machine learning methods in their causal inference model to estimate heterogeneous effects on, especially on the father absence effects in China. So been talking about machine learning, what is machine learning, right? Different people have different definitions and there are, there's not like a unified definition. But what I found in, uh, as a brief definition by MIT Technology Review, for example, that they believe that machine learning algorithms is a kind of a bunch of models that can help you to find and apply patterns in data and use statistics to find patterns in massive amounts of data. So three keywords here, patterns, you know, patterns from data and then statistics. So, I know when, whenever machine learning is mentioned to people, especially if you haven't seen sort of the use of machine learning in social science research or how machine learning is running, a lot of people will think it's more of like a computer or like an engineering um, concept. But what it really is fundamentally is just 
statistical models, just like all the statistical models, like regressions that we've been familiar with. This is just another way of another, another way to run statistics based on data. But there are some kind of differences from, especially if you're like, your research is mainly on hypothesis testing methods, right? Like uh, running hypothesis testing studies, especially for example, running some regression models or regression based models like SEM or like multi level modeling. Um, I think it would be good to compare, like, to would be helpful to compare what machine learning is to the hypothesis testing methods. So basically, compared to the hypothesis testing method where we, you know, have some hypothesis about the existence of an association, for example, between like variable A and variable B. Um, and then we use, um, so that's like our association assumption or hypothesis in the model. And then we would fit the model to the data and then see how well the data fit the model to know whether we're accepting or rejecting our hypothesis basically. However, the machine learning framework more uh, compared to uh, what we're familiar with in terms of a hypothesis driven, it is more data driven. And also it is more exploratory rather than confirmatory. So there are actually a few types of machine learning. So uh, like, um, and different ways of really categorizing it. A way to categorize machine learning is to categorize it into three, three types. So the supervised and supervised and reinforcement learning. And because of the limit of the time today, I'm only gonna focus on supervised learning. The supervised learning is really, I think the most widely used approach um, among in social science research when it, when it comes to the use of machine learning. So what is supervised learning approach? Basically you can look at this graph down here. Uh, and I'm sorry for the weird arrangements there <laughs> uh, because it's shown on Google Slides. Um, Basically what we do in supervised learning is we have some data about some features or some predictors, and we have data on the target Y, which is the outcome variable or the dependent variable. We feed these data into the learner or the algorithms really, and then the output from the learner, is a predictive model. So it is, it is a model that would fit well with the features X and the Y so that it can, uh, so that when you feed into new observations, let's say if you feed some new observations of X into this model, it will give you some new predictions of Y. So basically the gist is, this is the output for supervised learning is really the model that can help us to predict a certain, a certain outcome based on a bunch of independent variables. Um, and basically we're using the learner or the algorithm trying to maximize the prediction performance. So for example, sometimes it's accuracy, sometimes it's minimal error, sometimes it's really large R squared. And again, it is compared to what we're familiar with in the hypothesis testing world, it is more data driven, it's more exploratory, and there's typically no really like predetermined associations that we're testing using this model. And because of this, because of this exploratory nature, um, a lot of the times we can see that the benefit of machine learning models is that it really allows us to in include a large number of predictors, right? So for you, for example, if you're doing confirmatory research, if you're doing hypothesis testing research, you'd be worried about, oh, like, am I having too, ma too many hypotheses? Like, you know, if I want to include like 60 predictors in my model, what, how does that going to kind of the alpha level is going to decrease to very low because we, I need to adjust for the multiple testing issues. And so we rarely see like one study that um, that's like a confirmatory research that can really test a large number of predictors all at once, right? However, because, being, because machine learning is more exploratory and it's more data-driven, we can really do that in the research um, using machine learning. And then also another Additional benefit of machine learning, especially, is that using some algorithms, we can also, in addition to uh, including a large number of predictors, they can also allow us to freely explore some nonlinear effects and interactions between and among the predictors.
I really like this comic <laughs> by Chris, uh, Christopher Moner from his, his book, Interpretable Machine Learning. That's a really good book. Um, he kind of explained to people like what is like without and with machine learning, right? So on the right side or on the left side is what we are most familiar with, with hypothesis testing uh, method, for example, or regression-based method, for example, is that we give the computer very specific instructions, which is our very specific model and associations that we that we wanted to test. And the probably the computer tell us how well the data fits our model. However, with machine learning, we're more sort of feeding the data into the computer and let the computer tell us what the model should be. I'm sorry for this. But, you know, maybe looking at the comic, you're like, well, that looks really sketchy. It seems like machine learning isn't that rigorous or isn't that reliable. But there are ways, there are approaches in machine learning or techniques that can actually help to address some concerns about, for example, like the, uh, being rigorous or being like valid or being reliable. So one way you probably have have heard of it um, a lot in terms of the, what the machine learning people do is we do this training test split, or some, sometimes we call it holdout data or cross validation. But basically these, these are all the same thing. Basically what we do is we, when we're given um, a whole data set, usually we split it into, for example, two sets. One is the training, training set and the other is the test set. And we will only train the machine learning model using the training data set. And we like basically keep this test data set blinded to us first. So we, this is called the holdout data. And once we train our model based on the training data, we then test how well it performs using the test data. So that way we will know, okay, so this model that we train, not just kind of fitting well to the data that we feed it with, but also can kind of make some predictions based on some new observations. So this is one way we wanna make sure it's like kind of rigorous in the machine learning um, algorithms or, or machine learning approach. And some other approach uh, is what we call regularization. So in some algorithms, uh, there are ways we can prevent overfitting. Because you know, if you if you think about okay, like I'm just letting the computer tell me uh, a model that fits the data the best, of course there's going to be overfitting issues. And the way to overcome that is um, some some, for example, adding some penalty terms or regularization terms. So an example here, as um, Dale just mentioned, is an algorithm in machine learning is called Lasso regression, and it's basically kind of just. If you've used OLS regression, you would know it would be like kind of this is really familiar to you, right? So Lasso regression is just mainly based on OLS regression, but what it uh, but what's different about it is that it actually then added a penalty term in its estimation. So the the um, the goal or the purpose of Lasso regression is to minimize the combination of this part which we're really familiar with in OLS regression, and then this part, which is the penalty term. And the penalty term is basically the sum of the absolute values of all the coefficients we have in this model, um, and the times by lambda, and we'll talk about lambda later. But basically, this penalty term makes sure that we don't get this too far, right? We don't get this, the combination of the beta values, the coefficient values, too big. And especially this way, this like kind of absolute, uh, some of the absolute values, sometimes we call it L1 re regularization, really pushes all the smaller coefficients, so the coefficients that are closer to zero, to, z to become zero. And that way, Lasso regression is really pushing the regression model to be, to be as sparse as possible. This lambda here is basically kind of the parameter we define as researchers for how important this penalty term here is. So if the lambda is smaller, that means, okay, we care more about here 
minimizing the error here. We care less about the regularization or care, we care less about overfitting. And if we had set a, like a larger lambda value, then that means we care more about the overfitting. So just have some clarifications about supervised learning. Um, sometimes I know when people talk about supervised learning or machine learning, they usually think about kind of prediction of uh, binary variables usually, like true or false, you know, or accuracy or AUC, that's area under the curve. That's a lot of like terms that people talk about. But I really want to highlight here, actually, we can use supervised learning uh, to predict both like binary or categorical variables and continuous variables. And the algorithms we use are kind of actually pretty similar. They just kind of slightly different in terms of um, how you deal with the outcome variable. But basically the algorithms can serve as classification for like binary or categorical variable or regression for the continuous variables. And here is the list of some commonly used algorithms here. And I'm gonna go through some of them here in my presentation. See how the time is. One, uh, so beyond Lasso regression, one commonly seen way or algorithm in machine learning or especially in supervised learning is the decision tree, right? So basically we start off by like a root node and then we split the sample into different subgroups based on some conditions. And then we eventually end up with some leaf nodes with the categorizations of the sample. So for example, this was actually a uh, class project I did when I was learning decision tree back in grad school. So I was trying to separate who among the young adults who have graduated from college and who have not graduated from college. And I threw in a bunch of kind of family variables in there. And um, so it would start off by the whole sample, which back then was like 238 samples. And then first we would judge whether this first feature is whether dad's educational level is less than or more than 14.5 uh, years. And then based on this condition, we separate it into different nodes. And then based on more conditions, for example, mother's education or like siblings um, warmth, we, we further se separate them into different nodes. And finally, we end up here into different leaves. And then we kind of add up all the combinations of these conditions to say, okay, so if, for example, for, for like a case, for a case in our training data or test data, if dad's education is less than 14.5 years, spend time spent with mom is less than this, and mom's education is less than this, and mother's warmth is less than this, and then, then that will, this person would end up being classified as not graduated. On the other hand, if you can think if, you know, they meet all these conditions, then they will be classified as graduated. So that's kind of the gist of decision trees. And the decision trees have a lot of limitations. Uh, decision trees, I, I just say it's one of the algorithms that are really, really easy to subject to overfitting. And that's why people have been building on decision trees to develop some more like ensemble methods, what we say. And the ensemble methods, one example is random forest. And when, what random forest does is basically, instead of growing one tree for the prediction model, it's grow, growing a large number of trees. And for each tree, we use a random subset of the predictors in the data set. And then we use a bootstrap sample of the data set or of the observations we have in the training data. So it would grow individual trees. And then in the end, it would combine all these decision trees to make one single prediction model. So that's what the um, random forest does. And basically you can think of it as, as a, the wisdom of the crowd. So beyond those algorithms, I also want to note that one myth, especially among social scientists and about kind of suspicion for machine learning is that, well, it seems like it's just training those models that I really don't understand. Another way that's like 
we're like having these black boxes and I don't like black boxes as social science, as social scientists. And I, I agree with you, right? Like I don't like black boxes either. And so what is really good nowadays about a lot of the techniques in machine learning is actually they can help us to unpack the black boxes. Um, so something we call this like interpretable machine learning is really like a domain of techniques and domain of methods that people have been trying to develop. And one technique is what we call the SHAP method. And using the SHAP method, we can actually really identify what are the important features among a bunch of features that we feed into the model. We can really rank the relative importance of the predictors in the model. And then we can also reveal the relation between one or more predictors and the predicted outcome based on the model we train. And I'm gonna give you a concrete example soon. So again, actually just want to let you know, I think surprise learning is very accessible nowadays. It's very handy to run. There are a bunch of really good, well-packaged um, modules or packages, the Cisco packages just out there, such as the Python scikit-learn. That's something I, I use the most. Okay, so why do I want to use machine learning for family research? So there are actually some theoretical considerations here. So I'm a family systems person. And according to family systems, family systems are complex. There are numerous factors to examine, right? So if you think about what is going on in the family, I think about there are multiple family relationships. We can think about mother-child, father-child, interparental relationships, sibling relationships, intergenerational relationships. There's a lot of relationships there. And there are also multiple aspects of each relationship, right? There could be conflict, more autonomy granting, time, decision-making, a lot of things. And then there could also be multiple categories of resources on context in each family. You know, you think, think about all these socioeconomic characteristics, all those like health related behaviors, social, social cultural context, schools and peers. So a lot of the things we need to consider when we're doing family research. And furthermore, it's not just these single predictors, but we can also think about there can be interactions among these factors as well when we're thinking about a certain outcome to predict based on family systems. And so I feel like the problem here is we're really trying very hard to be hypothesis driven, but with so many aspects in the family that are theorized to be important, right? It is really hard to test all these things all at once, even you have the available data. Right, like how can you, you know, hypothesize like again 60 predictors to be associated with outcome in one study? So really, I there's kind of like a gap, I think, between the theory and our data here. It's like we can't really draw very specific hypothesis about what specific variables we can have, we have can be associated with our outcome. And, and that lead to a lot of dilemma. You know, we heard about something we call like <laughs> unguided manual exploratory analysis, which people don't really publish, right? People usually just, when, when they have some results, they just publish their confirmatory results. They don't really publish their exploratory results because a lot of times it's messy as, you know, like there's no systematic way. So I really think the utility of machine learning here is that it can help us, it can give us a tool to really conduct a very systematic exploratory analysis. And we get to publish those exploratory analysis so we can build on these exploratory results to run further confirmatory studies. I will give you an example here. Okay. Yeah, so this is, this is something I've already talked about, but the kind of use of machine learning for family research in the family research context is that we can take together a comprehensive set of family predictors as much as we have, right? To predict an important family or developmental outcome, we can evaluate the prediction performance of this comprehensive set of predictors. And then we can select or determine what are the most important family predictors here. And then we can further explore their interaction patterns or nonlinear patterns using um, machine learning. 
So here I'm kind of presenting the analysis that are based on these two studies. One is the study I published in 2020, and the other is actually a solo, my first solo author paper that I just submitted last week. <laughs> so all of these findings that I present here are like a fresh and hasn't been like presented anywhere before. I'm excited. Um, so basically these papers are about how we can predict young adults' educational achievement based on their family experiences during adolescence. There are a lot of theories out there to say, okay, family experiences during adolescence is very important, very important there for their future educational achievement. And you can consider a lot of like predictors, you know, that could be considered potentially important. And in this study, I mainly use the ad health data, and I'm sure a lot of you probably have been using ad health data as well and or familiar with it. Basically, it's a nationally representative large sample, um, large scale data set, and it has about 6,000 for the public use data set, and it has five waves. Ad health really measures a variety of domains of development, and including numerous, or not numerous, but a lot of family experience variables um, during adolescence. And then it also measured the academic or educational achievement in young adulthood. So I think that would be a good data set for me to answer these questions. What my research team has actually done is that in um, April 2022, we conducted a review of all of the ad, ad health based studies. So all of the studies, peer review studies that have used the ad health data that have actually tested somehow an educational outcome or academic outcome as an outcome variable in their study. So that in total was actually 143 previously published articles based on ed health. And among these 143 articles, we found in total 62 family experience variables were examined as some potential correlate or predictors of educational attainment in young adulthood. So these are the predictors that people have considered in their study in predicting educational attainment. You can see like a lot of domains. So can, of course, family structure you think of, family socioeconomic characteristics. So it's not just about the usual like SES indicators, but also about, for example, receiving public assistance, receiving welfare. There's a bunch of process variables on like family relationships and parenting. There are some behavioral variables on parents' involvement with education, some family sociocultural characteristics, some about family health resources and behavior, some parent and family relationship history, some adverse family experiences like physical abuse, emotional abuse, and then also, of course, some adolescent demographic characteristics. We still have to uh, consider those in the analysis. So across all these 143 articles, we actually identified 62 family-related variables that have somehow, at least in one of the studies, examined as a correlate of future educational outcome. So based on this literature review, we have three questions. The first question is, how well can this whole comprehensive set of family predictors or family experiences predict young adults' educational attainment? And the second question is, among so many predictors that people have considered, what are really the key ones, right? What, are really, what really are the important ones relative to others? And then the third question is, what complex patterns, including especially nonlinearities and interactions, which you know, have been relatively dismissed and neglected uh, in research compared to linear exclusive associations, what kind of complex patterns really can e exist there? To answer these three questions, of course, we use the supervised learning approach. And in my study, I used uh, four algorithms. So the lesser regression I've already um, introduced and decision trees and random forests. And then XGBoost is another kind of ensemble boosting method based on decision trees. You can kind of understand it this way. I'd be happy to talk about its technical details after my talk. So for this study, what we did again is we split the data into 80% and 20%. So 80% is the training data, 20% is the testing data. Within the training data, there's a step before 
there's a step we need to do before training the model, which is something called model tuning. And for model tuning, what I mean is that we need to find the values for the parameters in our, in our models. One thing is the, if you remember the lambda for Lasso regression, right? So this is the hyperparameter that we need to decide um, for like how big it is in terms of like how important the penalty term is contributing to this model. And then there are some other um, parameters for these algorithms as well. So for example, for random forest, we need to consider its number of trees. So how many trees is really good to run, you know, for this model to specify. And then what is the maximum depth of the tree, right? Like how big we can grow each tree into. And then the smallest to split size basically is to like what size of the node we need to stop for splitting it into further nodes and, and leaves. So, so what we do in terms of model tuning is we, we did something called um, five-fold cross-validation. Basically is we um, take the training data and we split it into five subsets and we run the model like five times. So, and each time we take four of the five folds for training and then we, we take the last one. So the fifth fold as um, for like validation. So we run through these FIFO cross validations and we then determine the best values um, for these hyperparameters that would actually make the model perform the best. So after we did these training, we determined the, the best values for these parameters and then we run the model. So we train the model based on the entire training set. And after we train the models based on each of these algorithms, then we tested how well the mo model performed using the 20% of the data, which was the held out testing data. And what we use in this um, study is the to evaluate the performance. So how well the prediction models are is to use the R squared and then mean square arrow because we have a continuous variables. Um, and yeah, so using this these metrics and using these testing results, then we decide which of the algorithms that we use here perform the best. And some more about the method. So I kind of briefly mentioned SHAP there. Again, SHAP is just a method or technique that can help us to interpret the machine learning models, especially the best performing machine learning models. SHAP is a, is a technique that has been developed based on the cooperative game theory. And what you can understand it is basically kind of it's estimating the contribution of each predictor for um, the prediction model. And based on the SHAP values, we can actually determine the relative importance of all the predictors in our module. And then we can also try to select the key predictors. So which are really the key predictors we can eliminate from our module because if we eliminate them, they're gonna substantially decrease our model performance. So yeah, a lot of usage for these SHAP. So basically kind of help us to determine the relative contribution, help us to determine the key predictors. And then we can also use the SHAP-based visualizations to interpret sort of the relations between each of the predictors and the outcome. So this is the result for the first research question. How well can this comprehensive set of adolescent family experiences predict young adult educational attainment? Across these four algorithms, we found that random forest performed the best. So the random forest model had the lowest MSE, so mean square error, and had the highest R square. And according to the random forest, is R square is 382, that means using the random forest model, we're able to predict 38.2% of the variance in young adult educational attainment according to our tested data. So this is kind of, you can think of this as, you know, the best performance we can get from this machine learning models after all the tuning and testing. And then you can also kind of think of the way as, okay, so this might be how much family experience variables matter, right, in predicting young adult educational attainment. And sorry the, for this weird arrangement, but the second question is we're trying to understand which family, which family experience factors are really the key predictors of young adult educational attainment. I'm sorry for this small font, but basically this is 
based on the chef values, we have a whole list or ranking of all of the 62 variables in terms of their relative contribution to the prediction model. And I sort of uh, crop them into three, <laughs> three separate plots and, and zoom, zoom in from here. So you can see basically these, this is the group of variables that have been identified as contributing the most or having the most uh, relative contribution to the prediction model. I'll, I'll come back to this, but the next thing I did was something we call key feature selection. So I, what I did is basically I started off by running the model with all of the 62 predictors, and then I eliminate the least important one, right? According to the shaft visualization, so according to the ranking, and then I run the model again to see its prediction performance. And then I eliminate the next least important predictor, and I run the model again to see its performance. And then I do this multiple times until you know I have nothing left in my model. And then I compile all of these iterations in terms of the MSC and R squared, so the prediction performance metrics to put here to see, okay, so until when, right? Like, cause we keep eliminating the predictors until when the performance would start to drop. And I found this key point here, which is the 14th top predictors. So until we, so we've been eliminating a lot of predictors among the 62 predictors, and we will stop at the 14th top predictors because that's when our performance start to really drop in terms of our predictions. What are these 14 top predictors? Now we can look you know, closely into them. They are father education, family income, mother education, smokers in the household, <laughs> sex, Mother's educational expectation, parents' religiosity, mother adolescent shared activities, parents' participation in PTA, intergenerational closure, family receiving welfare, mother's occupational prestige, adolescent's own age at baseline, and then parents' control. So kind of limiting their decision-making. So you can see here basically is what are important in predicting young adult educational attainment, of course, or something what we expect is like the socioeconomic characteristics. But beyond that, we also see there are some other process variables that can really matter, right? Some parent behaviors that can really matter, or some even health-related behaviors can, can really matter, potentially matter to young adults' educational attainment, like the smoke in the household, yeah? So is, I'm familiar with Van models. Uh -huh. I just have a quick clarifying question. I'm familiar with random forest models, and one of the limitations is the directionality is not output. Does SHAP give you the direction? Yes. That's the graph of all the direction the right. of the associations and the size. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah, thanks for priming me, actually. So yeah, so on the left is the relative contribution of these top 14 predictors, and on the right, SHAP help us to understand the directionality of these predictors. So basically a positive SHAP value means um, this particular observation is predicting higher educational attainment and a negative SHAP value means, you know, this is predicting a lower educational attainment. And they each dots are basically each observation in the training data set. And a red dot means that this uh, value is higher on each of the, each of these predictors. And the blue dot means you know, this value is lower on this, uh, on this particular predictor. So you can see here basically is if the red dots are mainly on the right, so mainly having positive shaft values and blue dots are mainly on the left, that means they have a positive association with the young adult educational attainment. And if it's the reverse, so if the red dots on the left and blue dots on the right, that means they have an active association with the educational attainment. So you can see a lot of them have positive associations, but of course the smokers in household have a very clear negative association. Sex is female, male, so you know, like gender, like gender gap in educational attainment. Um, family receiving welfare, this is a negative um, indicator, of course. And then uh, what else? Parents control, so this is a negative indicator as well. 
So we have 15 minutes left. Okay. So the third research question is about complex patterns, including nonlinearities and interactions involving in the set of the family predictors or the key predictors that we've identified. So here are just like some overview of some of the continuous predictors and how they are related with the predicted young adults educational attainment and zooming in them. Yeah, I actually found at least the six of them actually show some kind of nonlinear patterns here. So for example, if you look at the father education, mother education, they actually remain kind of flat, but I have like a big split point at around um, the level of 14, which is some college. So this is how mother and father's education might have a nonlinear association with a young adult educational attainment. Parent religiosity, you can see it almost look like a colonial association as well. What else? Like, for example, I think the mother's educational expectation is a really interesting one. It's almost like it almost kind of stay flat for most of its range, but it really jump to like kind of predicting high educational attainment when the expectation was really high. So again, these are the demonstrations or examples for how machine learning models can help us to identify some potentially nonlinear associations. And further, we can also see some interactions based on the shaft values. So for example, the sex moderation of father education and mother education, you can see it's totally opposite for female versus male. Of course, for female, you know, it seems like they um, benefit more from higher mother education. For, for male, they benefit more from higher father's education. And more some interactions between continuous variables like mother education and mother's educational expectation, family income and parent religiosity, for example. It seems like parent religiosity really matters in predicting higher educational attainment when family income was lower. Something more I wanted to note here is sometimes the interactions themselves can also involve nonlinear patterns, right? So um, if you look at this, um, or let's just look at this. Look at this interaction between fam, a parent control and the parent's participation in PTA. You can see that parents' participation in PTA actually kind of have a negative, almost a negative association with educational attainment when parent control was low. But then from like in the media range from like almost like two to six, parent participation in PTA matters more, you know, can predict higher educational attainment. But if, if parent control is really high, again, this sort of this pattern start to blurry away, uh, away again. So you can see there can also be some almost like nonlinear patterns in terms of how the moderations or how the interactions go. And further, there, the, the benefit of shaft values is that it can also help us to produce something called shaft force plots for each of the individual cases in the training data so that we know is how the combination of multiple predictors with their specific values would predict a certain attainment outcome. So these are the three individual cases I would show you here. So three individual LSS and um, the bold value here are their predicted attainment. And these, these features here are the features that actually contribute the most to this person, this particular person's educational attainment with these specific values. And the features on the left, you can think about it's like pushing, right? It's pushing the attainment to be higher. And features on the right are pushing the uh, attainment to be lower with their specific values. So, and, and then the larger the bar is, basically the more important it is in terms of the predictor's contribution. So you can see here is, for this person, for example, their father's education is really high, so it's pushing them to be higher in their attainment, but their mother's education is low, so it's pushing them to be lower attainment. And then uh, the no smokers in the household and have a lot of shared activities with their mother being female are pushing their attainment to be higher, but then the other factors are pushing their attainment to be lower. So you can kind of interpret it in a similar way for this person and then for this person. So this, these cases to me are also very impor important and interesting in terms of showing some idiosyncratic almost, right? Like some personal stories 
about their own kind of experiences of a bunch of family, uh, family predictors or their own family um, variables. And then how would those family variables being at those specific values would predict their specific educational attainment. And as also, also you can see is that the most important features for each person can vary, right? Even though, for example, father education is the most important predictor across the entire sample, it's not necessarily, it's the most important factor in some individual cases. So that's the sharp value, okay. I'm just gonna do a quick summary here. So um, in this talk, I kind of demonstrate the, the, the utility of a machine learning approach in research on family and youth development outcomes. It can help us to re review predictive powers with a relatively large set of family factors, can help us to review the key factors and then review some nonlinearities and interactions. And then in terms of the specific study on family experiences in adolescents in predicting young adult educational achievement, we found that 62 adolescent family features could predict educational attainment with 38% to 38% variance. And then uh, um, we identify some key family experiences in predicting the educational attainment. Um, they actually include both some resources and structural variables and also some process and behavioral variables. And then of course, again, kind of want to highlight that even though a lot of those variables, most of these variables were tested as linear associations in previous studies with educational attainment, there actually could be a lot of nonlinear and interaction patterns that exist here in predicting young adult educational attainment. And I think all of these exploratory results actually would be really good to lead to the next step, which is some confirmatory analysis. Right, so now that we know among these 62 family experience variables, those 14 variables might be the most important to, to explore or to test. And then there are some specific patterns like collinearities or even some like splitting spot, or you know that could probably lead to some fine models for us to test. So these are all good kind of hints for us to conduct confirmatory analysis as the next step. And I really think, you know, causal inference will be a good next step to follow up with these exploratory analysis. And causal inference is actually something I'm not really familiar with. I mean, I kind of know the basic concept. I'm not good at conducting it. And so the one of the purpose I'm, I'm giving the talk in the center is, if, I know there are a bunch of like causal inference experts here. So if anyone wanna collaborate with me and we can build a pipeline together and, you know, maybe develop a grant together, I'd be like more than happy to talk to you after this. And then of course, there are some other, um, some other next steps. So for example, my research team now is not just compounding family experience variable, but we're also compounding all the awesome other contextual factors like neighborhood community, school peers, and even some individual factors. And after we summarize even all of these factors and we're able to include all of these factors in the machine learning model, then we can then determine the, not just the kind of the absolute importance or predictive power of the family experience variables, but we will also know the relative importance of the family domain in predicting young adult educational attainment. And then there are also, I wanna say like one limitation of this study is, uh, of course is correlational. And also we know nothing about the mechanism that's happening here, right? Like why is smokers in household predicting a lower educational attainment? There could be some speculations, but we don't know for sure. And actually there are some um, mediation, exploratory analysis that can be based on machine learning. And so these, this can be another next step. Um, and also I'm interested in extending to other outcomes beyond educational attainment, like mental health, relationship competence, career success. And of course, all of these findings I'm presenting today are based on the ad health data set. So we don't know how well it works in other adolescent cohorts, right? So I think it's important to use other large data sets, especially to test this and um, even use some like cross national data. Okay. Thank you very much for your attention. Um, I'd be happy to hear any questions. And if you want to talk more, feel free to contact me through my email. Hi. Um, does the CHAP analysis um, study the collinearity of any of the non-14, like top 14 variables, I guess? 
mm-hmm. or the mix between the 14 and one of the others because I worry about like masking or like where one variable made it to the top, but it really was covering another. Yeah, that's a good question. So two things I wanted to um, respond to this. The first is I actually was also kind of worried about multicollinearities. And so before running the analysis, I did wrong pairwise correlations among all of these variables. And actually all of these variables were correlated at less than 0.80. So that's sort of like a rule of thumb for us to determine whether we should combine them, you know, or we should treat them separately. Um, so that's one thing we do for like data preparation almost, like before we run machine learning. And then also in terms of especially random forests, it's thought, at least it's, it's supposed to uh, deal with the uh, collinearities a bit better than regression models. So that's, that's my um, response. I think it's more about the model rather than like the shaft, like that technique. I want to thank you for a great talk today. I feel like the uh, connection between the application of machine learning in the social sciences has has been hindered. Um, And I want to re because of the difficulty of understanding some of these models, Mm -hmm. uh, I just want to reinforce how I think one of my colleagues has made this point, there's such an over-reliance on regression, one tool that so many of us use to the exclusion of all these other um, methods, and especially for methods that allow us to do resampling, bootstrapping, uh, robustness is really necessary. So I just wanted to reinforce uh, the the utility because um, we're often making these very simple hypotheses. Uh, and in social, that's great if you're a physicist, or you see the same thing happening again and again, and it, it abides by certain natural rules. But in uh, social sciences, we have these very complex relationships. Uh, and modeling the complexity uh, it has, is very difficult. So we have applied machine, the machine learning, some of the machine learning tools here, mm-hmm. recursive partitioning, the regression or the tree, the decision trees and, mm-hmm. um, random forest models, lasso. Uh, and it's been very hard. <laughs> it's been very hard to work as a team, uh, among the different statistician, the machine learning computer experts and the social scientists, uh, to figure out what we're doing. Um, uh, meaning like getting us all on the same page. Um, I just, uh, one thing is, uh, I, I, I wondered what the most difficult part of being an assistant professor using these methods in a social science department is, uh, because in epidemiology, which is my discipline, we're getting, we're getting a lot of pushback, uh, from hypothesis testing. And this is sort of, you know, very exploratory. And we also get a lot of pushback from that, that we're fishing. I really like the way that you talked about it, structured exploration um, (laughs) and really unmasking the black box. But I was wondering what is one of the challenges that you're experiencing? Thank you. Thank you for your comment, Teresa. And thanks for your very considerate (laughs) question, I'd say. I'm going to say my department, at least, is very is very supportive of me doing this research, so I'm, I'm, I'm I don't have a, you know too many problems with them. But when it comes to the bigger community, sometimes it's really about even educating people what machine learning is, right? So it's like we can't go into a room like I can deliver like a 15 minute conference talk, assuming everyone knows about machine learning, and then I just start presenting all my findings, right? Like what other people do. And so I think always like having to like, you know, kind of educate the audience about machine learning. It's it's a big, it's time consuming sometimes and it takes a lot of effort. But I I do see, you know, I'm I'm so glad to see that you guys are also using machine learning. And I do see like, for example, in the family research community and the developmental science research community, more and more people are using machine learning. So hopefully one day, it will become less work for us to explain to people the, the you know, the concepts about machine learning. And um, I also would say, yeah, sometimes people still carry like a mindset about regression-based analysis or hypothesis testing methods to ask me questions about machine learning, right? Like, for example, I present, present these sharp plots or contributions and they're like, but 
but what is the significance of your symptoms? Like, that's the question I get a lot. And that's when I tell people, well, like, you don't have a significance because we're not testing anything here. We're not testing the significance for the association here. And why is it so important anyway? Like, why do we always have to care so much about significance? So that's that's something sometimes I, I face, some specific questions I face. Um, but I also, um, what else I wanted to say? There was a there was a point that early on you made that I felt really agreeing with, but I'll, I'll come back to this maybe afterwards. Yeah. Any any other? All right. One quick uh -huh. question online from Phyllis Mullen. Phyllis, go ahead and ask your question. Sure. Yes, I, I really enjoyed this and uh, uh, look forward to reading your paper with my friend Susan McHale. The uh, I wonder if you've done any of the second method that you talked about. I would be very interested in how to identify clusters in the unsupervised method, because the group that I would care about would be those who don't fit all the advantages that you find in, in your analysis. I would like to find those who are first year college students or first, first in their generation college mm -hmm. graduates. Mm -hmm. And what are the, you know, that cluster of people, what predicts their um, uh, educational attainment. Yeah, thanks, Dr. Mo. And um, also really great to hear your voice. I can't see your face here, but great to hear your voice. I've uh, been super influenced by your work. I've uh, been mentored by Susan McHale and Nan Crowder. So of course, <laughs> I heard a lot about you. Um, but I think this is a really good question in terms of you know the utility of unsupervised learning. And I'm sorry, I didn't get to present it really here. But like what you said, right? Like it's, it's, I think it's a whole, also like a whole new, not new word, but it's a, a good a, a good bunch of uh, approaches there as well for unsupervised learning, like pay means analysis and cluster analysis to like kind of really um, separate people into different groups and then look at how kind of they, their like outcomes are or like they, their like mutual characteristics are in these groups. Yeah, but that's sort of out, sort of not what I'm really good at um, for now. But yeah, I'd be happy to explore more. One thing I would definitely say is I think you're also kind of talking about something like dimension, reduc uh, dimension reduction. Sometimes we call, um, for example, PCA, right? Like, so principal component analysis. Sometimes we actually run that before we run supervised learning models, right? Like, so we have these, for example, 62 variables we reduce the dimensions into like, for example, maybe five or six principal dimensions. And then we build the model space on these dimensions in predicting educational outcome, which is also great. I didn't do it because I actually, again, from the interpretation perspective, I think that's actually not really helpful in interpretability. So I didn't really do the dimension reduction part. Um, well, I think we're out of time. Thank you so much for your, your talk here today. Thank you, thank you so much for your attention and questions. 